Uh, so I am Rob. Uh, I am co-founder with Louisa, who is also with me, um, of Toast uh, and Chief Toaster. Um, and yeah, we'll be sort of trying to somehow uh, keep some order over uh, the conversation uh, this afternoon. Uh, Going to be welcoming Stuart uh, to um, talk us through uh, this delicious mango IPA. Uh, so I hope uh, those that are joining have a, a cold can uh, that they can grab from the fridge. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Heather after that to talk us through uh, the amazing work that Oddbox are doing and Karina uh, at Flawson. Uh, then we're going to open up to lots of questions. Any questions that you have, uh, do pop them into the uh, chat box. Um, I think we might even have a Q&A, do we? Or just the chat box at the moment? I think just the chat box. So just put questions into the chat box uh, and we will try and see them as we go. Uh, anything technical on beer, feel free. Anything about food waste, um, anything uh, about Flawsome or Oddbox or Toast, uh, just ask away. So um, just to kick things off, um, if you have one of these cans in front of you, uh, you will see on the side uh, that this one in our Rise Up series is all about uh, raising awareness about biodiversity uh, and the connection between biodiversity and food waste and the environment. Um, so each one of our Rise Up beers uh, has been raising awareness uh, about different things. And so this one's all about biodiversity. Um, and so we'll cover off a little bit more of that in some of the Q&As. Um, and I think sort of without any further ado, we're going to hand over to Stuart uh, to talk us through this bit. I'm going to crack one open. So if you do have one, please do feel free just to uh, dive in. It would be rude not to. So Stuart, talk yep. us through the amazing mango-ness oh, of this delicious yes. beer. Cheers. Thank, thank you, Bob, and, and hello, everybody. Um, so mango IPA. Well, that, that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it, to start off with a beer? I mean... Um, admittedly, our friends at Oddbox and Flawson probably deal with mangoes on a far more regular basis than I get to do at the brew house. Um, but they're a surprisingly delicate flavour. Um, you know, you get mango juice in the in the in the shops, and it's it's quite powerful. But when you actually start working with just a puree or or the whole mangoes, and you try to get these flavours into beer, then um, yeah, we, we've got to think carefully about how we we bring forward that that flavour and, and aromatic nature of the beer. So. IPA might sound like a rather crazy style of beer to go with in the first instance because IPA is big hops, it's piney resinous flavours, it's it's all the kind of things that you would think would completely dominate um, what was frankly some very lovely mangoes that we had in the, in the brew house. So we need to take a step back and change the profile because we've, we've got to make this beer nice and soft realistically. Um, so we want smooth bitterness in this, not sort of the harsh um, uh, characteristics like a, a traditional IPA. So we've gone around using this with some oats and we've used uh, about 15%, 20% of dried crumb, which is give or take about 30% by weight. If it was a slice of bread, we just dry it down first. Um, and we, we create a, a sort of very soft profile. So we, so we play around with the water content. We uh, add a bit more chloride than usual to generate this sort of gentle softness that's going to be the the palette if you like or, or the or the canvas for these mangoes to build up and, and create layers and depths of flavor um, with that though we also needed to make some interesting choices about the hops so um, hops obviously give flavor bitterness flavor and aromas into beers and for this particular beer we went with a wonderful hop from the states called azaka um, this is um, probably about six, seven years old now as a hop variety. Um, intriguingly, and I didn't realize this, it's named after the Haitian god of agriculture. I honestly don't know if that's true or just made up for marketing, but- Great uh, fact though, good one, good one to throw out there. Yeah, it could, it could be a fact, it could be completely made up. I, I suspect it's somewhere between the two. Yeah, for but, those um, that don't yet know Stuart well enough, a brewer's fact is a questionable fact. Uh, it's not yes, a fact yeah. in the conventional sense of the word. Yes. It, it's, it's a bit like Donald Trump's um, uh, news and fake news and, and facts and alternative facts, should we say. Um, so, yeah, so they have this wonderful aromatic hop. And now Azaka itself delivers out things like citrus and mango and a little bit of piney resonance, uh, which is just going to give that bitterness in the beer that's just counteracting the, the oats and the, uh, and the wheat and the breadcrumbs that are in there. Um, but this beer is not about particularly the hops. 
um, in, in many ways. It's not really about the breadcrumb either. It's about the mangoes. Um, so we had a bit of a, um, an interesting challenge. And certainly, uh, again, our friends at Oddbox and Flawson have realized that we didn't just turn up at the brew house and make this in one go. We had some puree. We did some tests and so on in, in the brew house. Um, and the biggest challenge with mango is the skin. Um, it's full of pectin. About 15% of the mango skin is pectin. Um, for those that you don't know, that turns things into jam quite quickly. Um, so we had an issue to deal with in terms of the type of mango we could use and where we could use it in the brew house. Because the brew is working sort of 100 degrees C, that will turn pectins into jelly in, in well, actually the beer into jelly in no time. So as we've got this wonderful boiling wort with all the, all the hops and stuff going on, We've taken, in the first instance, the whole mangoes that, that we got, and we've just literally chopped them almost sort of with a, uh, I'd like to say a sort of meat cleaver type uh, device. It was that kind of you know, rough chopping. Put those into a, a huge sort of muslin, or actually two muslin bags. So we have a sort of a, a tea bag, an infusion, and they went and were dropped into the kettle um, so the boiling after the boil. So we're steeping it, a bit like a tea bag. Um, we did a few tests beforehand. We recognized that 30 minutes of steeping was just enough to get some of the mango juices and the flavors and the aromatics out. And a lot of that flavor was actually surprisingly coming from the stone inside as well. Um, but not too much that we ended up extracting all the pectins from the, uh, the skin, which would then cause the whole thing to sort of start congealing and, and be a problem further downstream. So Stuart, have you learned the hard way in the past? Is this sort of something that you've learned from bitter experience of turning a beer into jelly before? <laughs> uh yeah so so Robert, I, I many many years ago um in, in a brewing past life in the southern hemisphere i made mango beer every single year probably using in excess of about eight to ten tons of mangoes um in those beers um so yes a lot of experience from from that suggested what you could and couldn't do with with mangoes as a whole mango within the brew house um so yes, yeah, so we have this, this, this wonderful infusion and it's, it's very much on that particular moment because it's hot and the, 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 the steam's coming out of the, of the beer or the wort. The evaporative sort of notes from that mango are, are, are gorgeous. It's like a fruit cocktail happening at that stage. But to really up it, because at that point we're not getting any color, if you like, because people associate mango with a sort of yellowy orangey note, which is what you'll see in the beer. There's no color coming from those, um, uh, those mangoes because you just physically can't get enough in there because of the pectin problems. So we then actually go and use mango puree. So the mango puree that we had went into the fermenter. So the beer is now being cooled down. It's going through into the fermentation vessel. And we had 100, um, 100 kilos, give or take, of mango puree in the fermenting vessel, which the, the wort was now coming into. And again, that, that just built the, the, the levels and the depth of, uh, of the aroma profile that was coming through with the, the mangoes from, uh, from the kettle, the whole mangoes from the kettle. The, the Azaka hop was complementing it. Um, so we had three hop additions on the hot side, which were just sort of building up the level of, of mango and citrus in there. And then during the fermentation, we used Azaka hops again, as what we call a dry hop. And that's giving a um, slightly sort of like, like a, a bit like salt and pepper, like a spice for, for cooking if you like. It's just elevating the other, other flavors up. So at the end of it, you're getting that, uh, not only the color and the, and the softness in the, in the palate, but when you crack open that can, you're getting that, that intensely fresh mango aroma coming out. And that, that was a big challenge for us to try and make sure that we didn't kind of cook it. So anyone that's, um, that's cooked fruit before, because um, we are working at 100 degrees C, you kind of recognize possibly that the smells of cooked fruit and that's not what we wanted in the beer. So yeah, quite, quite a little challenge, but um, a very good one, a very, a very interesting challenge for us and um, certainly appreciated the help from, from our, our partners here. Um, while I was making the beer, it kind of led me to think about perhaps uh, later on, once the beer was packaged, what I might actually want to have with that that particular beer so my, my personal favorite might sound an odd one is actually apple pie um sounds a bit of an odd, odd one you know people will think about food pairings you know is it like a meaty fish is there a sort of a cheddar cheese that kind of stuff i mean ipas generally work quite well with most things but for me apple pie it just seems to go to go the tartness of the apple with the sweet mango coming through at the end perfect i love it 
That's yeah. fantastic. I, I, I want to go grab some apple pie now. I mean, this is <laughs> this is absolutely epic, as is though, Stuart. You've done a, a, a cracking job. I, um, I, I, I mean, I, I feel like I probably say this every time we're launching a new one of these limited edition beers, but sincerely, I think this is the best beer we've brewed uh, to date. It is an absolute stonker of a beer. It is delicious, packed full of flavour, um, real depth of flavour as well. Uh, that's kind of layered through. Really lovely body and mouthfeel, and uh, yeah, you just want to oh, crack open a second one once you've uh, enjoyed that first. So well done. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, it's brilliant, and uh, I love the fact that um, when when we first started talking about it, um, you are one of very few brewers who was just like, oh yeah, I've brewed with mangoes before. It's like oh right, okay. Uh, so uh, not so much of a challenge as we as we had when we were uh, partnering with our friends at Tea Pigs and uh, and brewing with lemongrass for the first time. Uh, man mangoes tried and tested, know what you're doing. So uh, uh, so uh, too right that it should be. Back. I think the 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 only ever real challenge on this is probably stopping the assistant brewers helping themselves obviously when they're chop, chopping the mangoes up um to sort of make that tea bag infusion it's quite tempting if uh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and you haven't had breakfast to disappear with a mango and, and come back so i i can't guarantee that every mango that was sent to the brewery actually ended up in the beer some some did disappear for breakfast for one or two individuals good 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 right well Thank you, Stuart. Any questions anyone's got uh, for the brewing side of things? Any home brewers uh, that are with us uh, that want to uh, dabble uh, getting hold of some uh, wonky mangoes themselves to, uh, to brew with, uh, do fire through any questions that you have. Uh, but over to Heather. So Heather from Oddbox, um, please tell, talk us through the, I mean, just the amazing work of Oddbox. So I'd say um, of all of the businesses involved in fighting food waste oddbox is one of those businesses now that has absolutely cut through to the mainstream i feel like i am citing oddbox um about 10 times a day uh when i'm trying to sort of give the sales spiel of what toast is all about I'm like, have you heard of oddbox and now uh, so many people have it's amazing what you've done uh, to uh, to both sort of raise awareness uh, but also directly tackle the issue you must be tackling um I guess hundreds of tons of uh, uh, of, of fruit and, and, and veg waste uh, every uh, every day, so it's amazing. So uh, yeah, talk us through Oddbox um, and uh, and also specifically why surplus mangoes? Where are they coming from? What's that all about? Over to you, Heather. Uh, thanks, Rob, and thank you very much for your kind words. Um, and yeah, thanks, Stuart. Also, that was really interesting to learn more about how you know the mango bit. Um, so a bit of an intro to Oddbox. We are a sustainable fruit and veg box. Um, which fights food waste. So we work closely with farmers and rescue fresh and seasonal fruit and veg, which was at risk of going to waste because it was odd or surplus. Uh, we started in 2016, and since then we've saved more than 15,000 tons of food from going to waste. And our vision is a world where all food grown is eaten, but currently a third of all food produced is wasted, as I'm sure many of you know, which means that all the resources are wasted along with it. So all the water, all the energy, all the land that's used to produce food, when it's thrown away, they're all wasted as well. Um, and even at farm level, between 20 to 40% of produce doesn't meet strict cosmetic standards set by retailers. All of that's perfectly good to eat. It just looks a bit different. Um, and so that's what we, we want to take. So we run a supply-led model. So we never ask anyone to grow for us. We ask what's going spare, what's at risk of going to waste. We package it up and deliver it home. So we do a variety of small, medium and large boxes with just veg or fruit and veg. And we're currently delivering to London, Southeast um, and just expanded to cities in the Midlands, Southwest and Wales. Um, and yeah, any leftover produce that we've got at the end of each week, we donate it to charities who redistribute it to people in need. Um, and we're also a B Corp, so we want to make sure that the way we do business is good for people on the planet as well, and have committed to become net zero by 2030 and to have a fully electric fleet by 2025. And we've just published our first impact report, which we call our do good report, uh, which outlines how we do things a bit differently, what we've achieved and what our ambitions are. And so this is what a box look like, looks like. And this is what you get in it each week. Um, so it tells you some stories about kind of why the produce has ended up with you. It has details of everything that's come in your box and where it's come from 
and the reason it's there. So whether it's surplus or it's too big, too small. Um, and then it also has some recipes, some tips of how to store stuff to keep it fresh for longer, a link to a meal plan so you can go online and try and meal plan it and impact scores of how much the kind of carbon emissions and water the community has saved in the last in the last week. So example, we had some rhubarb this week, uh, which was from Norfolk um, and we rescued it because there, were, there was too much of it. And we also had some globe artichokes, um, which come from Spain um, and they were odd looking. I'm not sure what normal looks like because I've never actually cooked with one, but they look fine to me. But anyway, I'm looking forward to cooking with them. Um, yeah, also got aubergines, potatoes, onions, squash, grapes, peaches, all sorts. And it varies each week depending on what's in season and, and what would have gone to waste. Sadly, no mangoes um, this week. Um, but yeah, we were delighted to be part of this collaboration with Post and Flawsome um, and work with our fellow food waste fighters. I think we gave around 200 mangoes altogether, which came from Peru. And they were all rescued because they were surplus. So because of lockdown, lots of uh, food businesses have been closed. So they couldn't take what uh, they normally do. So, so they came to us to rescue them. So yes, yeah, so I'm very excited to be here. And I'm sadly, I'm yet to try one of the beers, but I think we have some in the office. So next time I'm in, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> next time I'm in, I'll definitely be trying. Oh, I'm embarrassed to say we haven't uh, sent one to your, uh, to your home to, uh, to enjoy. Um, and so I feel, I feel like mangoes are one of those things like cream eggs, kind of how do you eat yours? So um, how, how do you eat your mango? I'm a big hedgehog fan. For, uh, I was going to say I'm a hedgehog yeah I, I just you just got a hedgehog the hell out of that mango it's just uh, how i've done it since i was a little boy so um uh i guess a question that we're often asked at toast i just want to ask a couple of quick questions before um uh hearing from karina but just very quickly a question we're constantly asked is uh aren't we going to run out of bread for our beer you know as toast explodes and we're bigger than heineken carlsberg and fosters combined aren't we going to run out of bread which is obviously inevitable by the way that we're going to be that big but we're not going to run out of bread because there's so much bread so you must get asked all the time are you going to run out of uh of, of fruit and veg yeah which at the, at the moment we don't see it like the way that the food system is set up it's just you know it would be great I mean, our ambition is that we don't need to need to exist. Like we would love it if we didn't need to be here and there wasn't surplus and there were these strict requirements um, for produce to look a certain way or to fit in packaging a certain way. Um, but yeah, sadly, there is, I mean, there is so much that goes to waste and it, it doesn't seem like things are changing quick enough to, to kind of combat that. So, so as big as we get, I mean, we work with about 100 suppliers, but there's loads more that we can be working with so so i think as we expand surplus will continue to exist because farms don't necessarily know what they need to produce or what the weather's going to do as stuff is really unpredictable and if cosmetic requirements shift that would be great and people don't care so much about what things look like but lots of systems and machines are set up to only like allow certain size things there and you know supermarkets are giving wonky stuff away at, at a discount at the moment when you know as perfectly good it's just the same as anything else um so it doesn't necessarily need to be discounted so so yeah so i think there's lots of lots of barriers to overcome um in the supply chain to get us to that point but yeah it would be it would be great if we didn't need to exist beautiful music to our ears we feel the same way um and uh stuart could you brew up uh, rhubarb uh rhubarb would be pretty good in a beer right only if i could use custard as well rob <laughs> <laughs> You get a straight answer out of a brewer, my word. So, um, uh, and, and then mangoes, we must stress, was kind of one of the things. So we asked uh, Heather and um, her, uh, her colleagues um, kind of what we might expect a surplus at, at this sort of time of year. We sort of led with a few sort of hopes and aspirations of what might be available. I mean, the general trend was that it is very hard to predict with certainty what is going to be available. So Oddbox were really straight up with us that we'd basically developed this entire kind of recipe plan as to how to brew this mango IPA. But they were very straight with us that if there's no surplus mangoes that week, I guess like you've had this week, then, you know, we're not going to be brewing a mango IPA. So that was a, uh, a little bit of a, mm -hmm. uh, a discomfort gamble we were taking in the background uh, leading, uh, leading up to this. Uh, Heather, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone that's got questions, uh, please do um, fire them through. Uh, so, Karina, over to you. 
uh, to tell us all about Flawsome, please. Hey. Which I must also stress is an epic brand. Um, I, it's purely the odd box I feel I'm literally saying day in, day out. Flawsome is an absolute kind of uh, sister brand to us. It's, uh, it's doing uh, almost what we do, uh, but in the world of uh, soft drinks. So we're massive, massive fans uh, of the good work of Flawsome. So, uh, yeah, for those that don't want an alcoholic beverage, uh, dive into a Flawsome. Sure. So my name is Karina. I am a founder of Flossom Drinks and obviously chief marketing officer as well. I look after marketing. Um, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to, of course, uh, partner up with such a brand that share the same vision as us and really raise kind of awareness on why we need to protect and make space for nature. And of course, at the same time, so support biodiversity. But in terms of Flossom, how it all started, we had a simple vision, a world where food isn't wasted needlessly. Really started everything from a trip to the supermarket back in 2015. Myself and my business partner lived in London. And when going really shopping, we were always surprised to see fruit selling fruit of the un and being uniform size and usually wrapped in plastic. And this was always for us a really kind of a strange creature because, you know, why would you have just, you know, perfectly looking fruits and vegetables and again, you know, everything being packed in plastic, which was, you know, always kind of, we were questioning, you know, this. And later on, we decided to do, of course, a bit more research on the food we consume and uh, understand to be normal, particularly fruits and vegetables. We then visited farms in the UK, uh, as well as in our countries like Poland and Lithuania, because this is where we are coming from. Uh, spoke to growers and really then kind of our eyes were open to food waste problems, specifically that effect that excessive, I said, standards have on the food we consume and to really understand to be normal. There were a lot of different issues we encountered. So one of them was unfair treatment. Uh, which was a massive challenge for the farming industry. If we talk about the supply chains, both in the UK and around the world, business practices often drive waste. Trading practices, including last minute change to forecasts, overproduction to ensure farmers can uh, supply their customers uh, on time. Order, order cancellations is the, not another one. And again, cosmetic specifications that I was obviously mentioning previously, that does not approve certain produce, produce that should be produced such as too small, too big, or simply ugly. Uh, and again, another issue we faced was the post-harvest loss, which was another issue in developing countries that includes limited availability of suitable varieties, for example for processing or simply lack of basic infrastructure. And these, of course, all practices cause for food to be wasted. And some of these practices may be considered as unfair. And therefore, at Flossum, we hold stringent sustainable practice, uh, sourcing policy where we don't ask farmers to grow fruits for our drinks. Instead, we source our fruits from surplus stock, which means that no extra natural resources are required to make our juices. So really kind of at that time as well, we came across Love Food and Hate Waste campaign that stated that we waste 4.4 million apples every year just in the UK. So this was just, you know, opened our eyes and we decided to, of course, cold fresh juices inspired by our Nan's Tasty recipes to rescue imperfect and surplus fruit and really transform it into perfectly crafted cold fresh juices. Epic. And uh, what's your, um, what, so that was your flagship, was it the apple? Was that the kind of where you started? And then you've now got really? the full range. Yeah, so all of our range is based on apples. Of course, apples are, you know, the, the biggest, uh, the second biggest uh, manufacturer of apples, of course, is Poland, after Canada. And uh, for us coming from this kind of uh, countries, especially myself and my business par partner always shared the same values we were grown up, helping our grandmothers uh, around their vegetable plots. And really at that time, no one ever cared about the appearance of, appearance of their produce. It was always about appreciating and treasuring things that you know, we have got. Uh, I'm proud to announce that we have achieved carbon negativity. 
just a couple of months ago, it was definitely a lengthy process to go through as we wanted to make a even better impact by not just offsetting our, our CO2, but actually reclaiming all of the CO2 that our company has ever emitted. We are also part of Vicor family, which is an incredible achievement where we invest nearly 2% of ourselves and not just our profits in environmental causes and charities around the world. And so far we have saved over 1000 tons of one can surplus produce. And to put that into perspective, it is equivalent to 550 black caps, which is actually 100% of our 2020 target, which is really, really incredible. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. Huge congratulations. And on the carbon negativity as well. Absolutely epic and a real inspiration to uh, us and, and our box because we have the same aspirations as our box in terms of our carbon neutrality target. Um, but it's still a few years away. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll definitely be coming to you. And I think for those that aren't familiar with the B Corp movement, um, it's this collective of forward thinking businesses like ours um, that then really partner up and support each other. And so I know that we'll be coming to Karina with uh, sort of, you know, help us. <laughs> those, those, uh, those ideas that you've got that could really support us on our mission and, and our aspirations, um, we will definitely be looking to, uh, uh, to pinch. Uh, so uh, yeah, amazing work. And then, um, also to share, I don't think I've shared this with uh, Louisa and Stuart before. Um, it's it's apples that uh, that sort of uh, got my uh, uh, or I guess served as my inspiration. So uh, when I was a little boy, uh, my uh, my dad um, was in the fruit business, and so would get me uh, sort of summer jobs picking apples uh, off the trees. I'm born and raised in Kent, Garden of England, lots of apple uh, orchards, and so I would pick apples every summer. Uh, and my, my, I guess my first insight was just the fact that we were chucking away so many apples that didn't meet the grade. We were all, as pickers, given these, uh, uh, these ringlets uh, that the apple had to be the perfect size uh, to go within. Uh, if it was a little bit too big, if it was a little bit too small, they just got chucked. Uh, and from a very young age, I was just like blown away. And I did this summer after summer thinking, so much waste. So uh, yeah, that was my uh, initial inspiration for um, uh, doing the work that we're doing. Um, just turns out that you can't make as good a beer with apples, hence uh, toast. Uh, and uh, and I'm more into beer than I am cider. So uh, so that's why uh, that's why toast and uh, and not a cider business. Um, so um, amazing work. Thank you so much, Karina. Uh, Louisa, I think you've got a couple of um, good little uh, sort of pop quiz questions that you can uh, throw out there for us, right? Yeah, sure, we can do that. Um, yeah, so thank you so much um, uh, for explaining to us like all of the problems around food waste. Um, and the reason that we are talking about biodiversity loss is about the, um, the huge impact that the food system in producing our food in the first place um, is having on nature, um, plants, animals, all the creatures um, that we share this planet with. And then of course, we're, um, despite all of um, you know, the pollution that is caused uh, to the planet, um, to the land changes that are removing habitats for creatures, um, and they're just a very like destructive way in which we're growing our food. We're still wasting a third of everything. Um, so that is what we're doing with this beer, trying to raise awareness that the food system is not working for nature, um, but we can make a very simple change by reducing food waste to immediately reduce that pressure by a third. Um, so we just had a, a couple of poll questions just to try to assess the, um, like the understanding of the scale of some of this problem. So the first one, I will, it should pop up on your screen now. And if you could just vote. So the first one, how many species of plants and animals are currently threatened with extinction within decades, this is? So we've got 100,000, uh, half a million, 1 million, or 1 billion. I'll give everyone a second to... Oh, it's cast a tough one, Louise, which you just go for the big number because you've tried <laughs> to you know throw it out there you just play it safe and go for the middle numbers oh, it's not going to be the low one surely oh. great well everybody um obviously understands that it is a big problem um and the majority of people were correct as one million species that are currently threatened uh with extinction and food production is the biggest driver um, of that. Uh, one more poll um, to give you an idea of the scale at which uh, we are producing food on the planet. 
Um, how much of the global land surface are we using for food production? Is it 10%, 20%, 33% or 45%? And so this is just the land surface as well. Obviously we, um, we use the, the ocean as well, but just from the land, um, how much of it is given? My word, and don't we use the ocean? We've all just watched Sea Spiracy recently at Toast and it's blown our minds. So, uh, yeah, and we're eating a lot oh. less fish, aren't we? No fish. I went to the seaside well, this weekend and didn't eat fish. I was so depressed. I can't ever eat a fish again. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult watching. Great. Okay. Thank you. So again, yeah, a huge amount of land is given over to agriculture. Um, it's a third, about a third of the, um, the physical land surface is used. Um, so again, um, most people were, were absolutely correct there. So yeah, that's, um, that's all about this beer was about helping us to raise awareness of uh, biodiversity. Um, it's part of a series of limited edition beers uh, called Rise Up. Um, each of them talks about a different topic with another B Corp partner. So also Toast um, is a B Corp um, and yeah, very proud to be part of the community uh, with Oddbox and Flawsome. And then we have another beer coming up as well, Rob, if you want to announce this one for Friday. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we've got a hazy pale ale, 4%, lots of oats in there. Um, with our from our friends at Rebel Kitchen, so uh, yeah, watch this space. Uh, and uh, uh, I might have already enjoyed one or two. It is also an absolute cracker. Um, and so obviously, oh, I've got to say it because we're here. The mango is my favourite, but don't tell Rebel Kitchen. Um, so, um, uh, so a couple of quick questions. So I've got a couple of questions. I don't know whether we've got any questions on the chat box other than just uh, doubting Stuart's. Um, comedy genius uh, how could you ever doubt Stuart um, and so um, a couple of uh, yeah quickies from my side so just I guess very specifically um, Karina and Heather because I think what Louise has just done there really well is obviously explain that connection between uh, kind of land use and um, environmental uh, uh, kind of catastrophe that we're facing and the food system and biodiversity so i think we've got that sort of interconnection but why are farms wasting food in the first instance so for i guess for bread we're very aware you know day fresh product cheap to make high profit margins um there's sort of waste throughout every step of the supply chain with uh with bread waste uh with with fruit and veg i think we touched upon uh, obviously some of the the wonky and the ugly um but there's also just surplus right so 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 where is the the waste primarily driven from and where are you sourcing most of your your waste from? Go for it, Heather. Um, yeah, thanks. And Karina covered a lot of the kind of reasons in her, but I guess there's, there's three main reasons that we take stuff. So surplus is one, so there's there's too much of it. Um, so it can be from overproduction. I think I think farms grow about a third more than they know they need to or that they have orders for because they know certain things might happen that are out of their control or things might not meet requirements so there is often that overproduction but that can also be from crop flushes if the weather's really good so they have more than they program to sell a lot of what we've taken recently has been because food businesses are closed so all the stuff that they would have sent to restaurants and caterers that they had you know planted well in advance then didn't really have a home um, and then there's also issue of cancelled orders poor performing sales means that retailers kind of change plans last minute, which is obviously really hard for growers as things take a long time to produce. Um, then the other, another reason is sometimes we take things where there's too few. So sometimes um, we will take a trial variety or if there's too small quantities for a retailer's sake, we take that. Um, and then the other reason is kind of cosmetic standards. So something's too big, too small, too wonky. So if it doesn't fit in the packaging that it's meant to or it looks a bit funny they don't people don't think they'll buy it so um so they don't take that either and what we found and we just released a kind of a story about it with one of our growers is um the asparagus which takes two to three years to grow like it takes ages to grow asparagus and um, because of the weather recently it's been really cold in april and uh, may it's put a lot of pressure on to the asparagus so they've started growing monkey already so the, the farmer knows that they, all the stuff that they planted, you know, two or three years ago 
is not going to be fit now for supermarkets because it's going to be a bit bent. So it's great that we are able to take that and kind of give it give it a home um, where it otherwise wouldn't have. That's epic. Yeah. And then so so Karina, maybe just before I come to you, just a quick follow up, Heather. So the I think what we're all now seeing is the wonky and ugly and misshapen fruit and veg has hit the mainstream. So most of the big retailers are also selling lines of fruit or veg that are wonky. How legit is that? So I guess the cynic in me, the skeptic in me might think that when big retailers get involved, are they actually just procuring certain sort of um, uh, fruits or vegetables that might not necessarily always have been surplus? Um, is it legit? And is that also uh, making a, a big impact? Obviously, you've pioneered something that others are following suit. Is that helping or, or are they still not actually getting it quite right? I think it, it, it's it's good that people are kind of getting on board and uh, are helping it and addressing that it is the problem that we are, you know, superficial when we look at food, when we don't need to be because it all kind of tastes the same. But um, but yeah, but I think, I think, I mean, an issue with it is that it's often sold at a discount or like a lower price, which which makes people consumers think that it's it's lower value um, when it's when it's not. So what we do is try and work quite hard to find the, the price point where it's fair for prices. So we want to cover the costs of them growing it, maybe give them, make, make them have a small profit, but we obviously don't want to be um, too attractive and pay the retailer like as normal market costs because we don't want to ever want to grow for us and be an attractive um, buyer. So, so we try and hit that kind of sweet spot in the middle where people are being paid fairly for the produce um, and that they get, they get that kind of support. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, so I guess I, I don't think um, your sort of average person would have really connected the dots that by devaluing it to sell it cheaper than the sort of spherical uh, fruit or vegetable next to it actually might perpetuate the issue in and of itself by devaluing something that we really shouldn't be devaluing yeah. um you're then just passing something through the supply chain that's actually just perpetuating the issue interesting so we all need to uh, put our hands in our pockets and buy ourselves in our box so uh, i think that's the uh, <laughs> uh, the prim primary solution uh, so um karina what what, what was it you were going to chip in with well, I well, I think Heather kind of shared quite a lot, but I think it's 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 really kind of important to mention that consumers are willing right now already to buy produce that looks imperfect. And I think retailers understood that just a couple of years ago. So of course, Morrison's was the first one that introduced one key packs in in, in the stores. Uh, we would probably never find out actually, you know, where they're sourcing this produce. But I think it's really really right now already um opened uh, in terms of you know what is happening and we believe i think that consumers have the power to influence quality standards and should do so and this is what we are kind of our uh, as a brand as well trying to raise awareness about but of course as heather mentioned you know food waste at the retail level particularly and on the consumer level tends to be higher um in kind of middle and high income regions where it accounts to approximately 31 to 39 percent of total wastage. Uh, of course, there's a lot of actions already that are taken to minimize that, but you know, there is still uh, quite a lot to be done. So at Flossom, we are not only focusing on surplus stock, but also one key. So one key, which is, you know, too big to small, either ugly, as well as surplus stock that, uh, you know, we take from the farmers. Uh, and, and again, you know, I think what was mentioned is again, strict, you know, standards about the sizes, uh, despite the fact uh, that fields uh, and, and trees are naturally produced fruits and vegetables in a wide range of shapes and sizes. Uh, this means that sometimes of the year, the sizes that uh, stores want are simply, uh, you know, less available. Uh, this in turn, of course, causes a surplus of the sizes that they are not buying like small and large items. For example, fruit harvested later on the season might be larger from having been on the tree longer, while the first batch of, of it might be smaller than later harvests. Um, and again, I think another example is uh, the preference and that drives waste it is our tendency to buy trendy and seasonal items during very narrow window 
of time. Yeah. And again, retail grocery stores who focus pushing on selling certain produce during winter, another produce during summer. And actually, it could be uh, the, the fact that all this produce growing year round. Uh, and a great example, perhaps, of it would be mandarins, uh, mandarin oranges, which are in trees for months, despite being heavily hyped by retail for only a few weeks in December. So, you know, it's there are a lot of um, uh, yeah. things. Of course, Interesting, because I guess also, though, layering the complexity of what, again, most people might think of that you should buy seasonally. So it's obviously uh, it's a more complex issue than than just buy seasonal because you might be buying seasonal that the retailer is pushing that isn't necessarily okay. even a retail product uh sorry a seasonal a seasonal yeah. product uh really interesting um okay so uh before i wrap up um would love a couple of top tips on uh reducing fruit and veg waste so for me i used to waste a lot of lemons and limes uh, i'd kind of buy my lemon or lime for uh a sort of a, a greedy cocktail evening on a on a Friday uh, and then inevitably uh, not have uh, used up all of the, the lemon and lime thankfully didn't drink that much gin and tonic um, and uh, and then I have it left over uh, and then it wasn't until I saw that obviously you can just cut them up and freeze them uh, that the the solution was was there and so I've just got loads of wedges of of lemons and lime in my in my freezer that works really well because they also work as an ice cube perfect um, I have tried and failed in the past to start so those at Toast know that I'm prone to sort of go off in weird tangents and start uh, interesting new ventures. One of my many business ventures I have tried and failed to launch in the past was something called Banana Bites, where I bought lots of bananas, chopped them up, froze them, because you, like a frozen banana is a bit like uh, banana ice cream, uh, would coat them in chocolate uh, and thought this was going to be the next big thing. But bananas don't freeze very well. They, turns out, they go brown and mushy almost instantly when they come out of the freezer. So that was a miserable fail. So top tips for what fruits and veggies you could save uh, very effectively not necessarily just freeze them. Any other top tips? Heather, hit me. Yeah, I know. One that's helped me a lot is, is meal planning and just being way more organized and kind of auditing what I've got like in the fridge before I go to the shop, decide what I'm gonna cook each week. Once I get an odd box, cause odd box you get the same day each week. It makes it quite neat for you to be like, right, this is what's in my odd box. So this is how I'm gonna plan it for the week. Um, and yeah, and also organizing your fridge so you put like anything that's going off sooner like at the front or on like a certain level make sure to check labels know the difference between like best before is about quality whereas used by is about safety and knowing the difference between that and just trying to yeah make sure that you're planning and you're organizing and that you're you're using up everything nice awesome karina well, there are a lot of ways, right, you can uh, extend shelf life or even vegetables or fruits, uh, as you've mentioned, for example, you can actually place, you can cut your carrots uh, in sticks and actually place it in the water and they kind of preserve for longer in your fridge. Uh, you know, of course, as, as Heather already um, mentioned, again, over-purchasing is, I think, the, the, the massive problem that we have and then not being able to consume it in the right time and then overreacting perhaps to best before date. Yeah. Um, let's say we've had uh, quite a few customers that would be afraid to drink our juices, even though, for example, there was just a mistake, you know, in supply chain, someone sent them a couple, a couple of days due to the expired drinks and people were just like emailing us, oh, but you know, I think it's just absolutely wrong to be consumed because, you know, people are not educated about it. I think there needs to be education that, certain obviously products that are perfectly fine to be consumed even after uh, expiration of course with dairy it could be a bit more complicated but there are a lot of products that we can definitely still consume if, even after the expiration but of course uh, again we need to definitely keep in mind that you know we don't we don't need to over purchase and to really plan you know our kind of uh, habits of purchasing uh, enough yeah for yourself to be consumed within a quick uh, period of time. So Waitrose and, and Ocado then uh, both have their own B Corp marketplaces yeah, for do. those that are stocked there um, as, as B Corps. Uh, so well worth, yeah, checking, checking those places out. Um, awesome, I think that is it for all the questions. Um, 
so i think all is left for me to say a huge thank you to stuart absolutely brilliant beer like i said uh, i really do think this is uh, our best beer beer we've brewed um in our uh, five and a half years uh, or so so far so uh, yeah absolutely stellar job and uh, yeah looking forward to this might even i think uh, make it into the core range in some way shape or form so watch this space let's see whether this one gets brewed again because uh, i think there's plenty of space for a, you should uh, try banana beer actually i i've if you've ever heard obviously there is a lot of yeah stuart beer. was very keen uh, so for, tasty uh, there is banana. one actually in poland so uh uh, so there is a, a site that actually manufactures banana beers and uh, it's absolutely tasty beer as well. So I still didn't try your mango beer, so I'm really keen. So I, my team actually uh, secured a few for me <laughs> once I'm back to the UK because at the moment I'm abroad. So, um, yeah, I'm really, really keen. I think it could be very similar kind of in, in the texture, quite similar to banana texture, quite heavy and nice. And yeah, would love to try it. Uh, yeah Stuart you're a fan aren't you of uh, giving it a go yeah <laughs> uh, I think we just need to to be led by whatever surplus in that week don't we we can just do anything then yeah oh bring it on um so Heather Karina thank you so much Louisa thank you for uh, peppering us with uh, facts and stats um and yeah thank you everyone um cheers and uh, do enjoy the rest of our uh, rise up beers uh, there's many more in the series that you can buy at toastale.com uh, and then also more to come so like i said like louisa said uh, another one launching this friday and um more after that as well some very exciting beers in the pipeline so cheers everyone cheers, cheers.